Well, good morning and welcome on this beautiful and sunny Sunday morning that God has made today. Welcome to Grace Street Church, and we thank you for being with us today. And we want to bring you a message of hope in the midst of this crisis. My name is Pastor Mark, and along with Pastor Terry and Pastor Josh, and the rest of our church community, we welcome you here today, and we are blessed by your presence. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, you are the God that hears our prayers, and you have said that you will be present whenever two or three are gathered in your name, and we praise you and thank you for that. And we may be separated today by distance now, but we come together today in unity of spirit. We welcome your presence with us today and for your grace in our lives. We ask that you would bring forth your glory today and shine your light upon us. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life and health. Thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to be in your presence again today. Another day of life. We confess today that we are sinners, Lord, and we are in need of your grace and mercy. And we pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus, that we might be redeemed and return to that righteous relationship with you, O oh God. We come together today in the unity of our faith. And we ask today that you open our ears to hear your word, our eyes to see and behold the glory and our hearts to accept your truth. We pray as we continue today's church service that we will feel your presence among us. We pray for all of those here and those who are joining from home today, that we may always serve you and grow in you. And at the end of our service today, let us go out into the world and glorify your name and live in your presence. In your precious name we pray. So today is our third in the series of our Easter Challenge sermons, and today we want to talk about how the truth of God is rock solid. It's an unwavering promise that he has given to us that has held the test of time for over 3,500 years. And I'd like to start off today, and, and I have a couple of instances here, a couple of illustrations that I want you to think about as we go through the sermon today. And so in 1981, Muffin was barking ferociously in the backyard and May Rose Williams thought that she was probably chasing a squirrel and came out to see what was going on so she could quiet the, the dog down so it didn't bother her neighbors. Well, she didn't see a squirrel and instead she found a sinkhole opening up in the front yard of her Winter Park, Florida home. And it kept opening until it swallowed up her entire home. But it didn't stop there. It went on and it enveloped it and, and swallowed whole the community swimming pool as well. And it did around $4 million worth of damage. And nearly 30 years later in Guatemala, Tropical Storm Agatha swept across Central America. And in doing so, there was a sinkhole that opened up in Guatemala City, and it swallowed up an entire three-story building. So I'd like you to keep those images in mind today as I read Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And yet, it did not fall, because it had its foundation built on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. 
Building our lives on the rock of God's word is the only sure foundation that we have in life. Every other foundation is simply shifting sand. And as I look at the turmoil and the tumult that we have in the world today, it seems like our culture and the culture of the world is taking a few steps further than simply just mere shaky foundations. And I'm afraid some of the foundations and some of the truths that people build their lives upon and are guiding our world today may look like a decent foundation at first, but in the end, they're more like a sinkhole that threatens to swallow us up. With our current situation with the coronavirus, we hear daily of the people who have lost hope and became swallowed up in fear and uncertainty. Those whose foundation was built upon false assumptions that tomorrow will take care of itself have no options for hope. They become disparate. They become disillusioned some to the point of taking their own lives. If only they had known that hope is found in Christ. Now when Jesus talked about the two builders, you'll notice it wasn't a matter of if the rain would come, it was a matter of when the rain would come. Well, the rain did come, the waters did rise, the winds did blow, and it did beat against the house. Now, I don't want to kind of scare you today in, in thinking about that, but you don't have to worry about the winds and the rains and it's shaking and breaking down the house. If you have a foundation that is strong enough to support your life. See, it probably has already come into your life a number of times before as it has in mind. And the foundation of your life is the difference of a life that stands firm and a life that swallows itself up. A life of hope and a life of desperation. So I want to ask yourself today, what kind of builder are you? Every day you and I are laying down the bricks of a structure of our lives. And what we are living today is the result of what we built yesterday. Every day at work, every weekend, every interaction is part of a structure that you're building called your life. And whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or a Christian, most of us build careers. We build families. We build friendships. And the main difference is found in the foundation that underlies what we are building. When you lay a new floor down, you want to go through and level things out and you want to put down a new underlayment on there. So that floor lays level and flush. And as a result, that floor will last a lot longer with a lot fewer problems. So what is underlaying and shaping everything that's built in your life? Is the career building starting and standing on your desire to know and follow Jesus to glorify him? Or is it built on your desire to get what you want? To be better than those around you? Is it simply for status? For money? For material things? Those who have built it all on Jesus can lose it all and yet they still have everything. They still have hope. They still have Jesus. And those who have built on the desire to get what they want, the material things in life, when they lose it all, they've simply lost it all. Hope included. You can't take those material things with you, but you can take Jesus. And that should give you an absolute thrill knowing that you have something that will transcend this world, that you have that hope of that life everlasting. 
So let's talk about those wise builders that we are trying to support our lives to be. Did you notice what Jesus said about how we build the foundation? He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock in verse 24. While this building is intimately linked with our salvation, see, I don't think this is a saved or not saved passage in the Bible. You can believe in Jesus, you can sneak into heaven and waste most of your time on earth with nothing to show for it when it's over. And what I mean by that is uh, taking Paul's illustration that he gave us in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, and he said, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones or wood or hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one who is escaping through flames. Now, I believe in Jesus' words in Matthew 7, they're more about being wise or unwise in the way that we live. I believe he's showing us the difference between a life full of joy and a life full of misery. He's pointing out the way to a faith and witness that endures and overcomes no matter what comes against it compared to a faith that crumbles and collapses at the slightest amount of resistance. So you can believe in Jesus and have a shallow faith. I call people like these occasional Christians. And we've had a couple of sermons that touched upon that point. And it's like what I term the sea and ears that claim to be believers, but they only go through the motions. They show up at Christmas and Easter and they think they're good to go. But it really shows that they have a lack of a foundation. And Jesus said that it all comes down to two things. First, you hear my word. And second, you live my word. A foundational life that's built on the truth. And I want to touch on those two points again. First, you hear my word. And second, you live my word. A lot of people follow through the, with the very first point of that, and they hear the word of Jesus, but they don't take it into their heart. They don't make that the foundation of their lives, and so they fail to live out that word that Christ gave us, that foundation. We need to take that in to our Holy of Holies, into our heart, and live it out on a daily basis. There's no way around the authority and the importance Jesus put on the Bible. When, when we talk about God's word in here, in John 10, 35, Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. So in his ministry, Jesus pointed back and affirmed the accounts of Abraham and Isaiah and Moses and Jonah. He quoted the prophets and the law when he drove his points home to the people. And one of the major, major reasons that we believe that the Old Testament is the truth is because Jesus testified to it. And I want you to think of it today as building on that foundation. So at least 20 times in the four Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus pointed to the Old Testament when he said, it is written. And it is amazing that the one who had the power to cast out demons and to command them where to go and what to do, use the words of the Bible to resist Satan himself. That means that the word that is written there, God's word, transcends anything that comes against us in this life, natural or supernatural. 
this is a clear statement that's being made for us when Jesus, who had the power to just move a finger and bind Satan up for all eternity or destroy him with a simple thought, dealt with him with three different times saying only, it is written. That shows the total power of God's word. Jesus' example shows us that the truth and power of God's word are the foundation for living our lives. And we have the same scriptures that Jesus used to defeat Satan to see us through the, our trials and tribulations each and every day. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is the truth, but it's a different kind of truth. Something that just works or makes sense. Because it is breathed by God, the word of God is a kind of truth that cuts through spiritual chains that hold your heart in place. It breaks those chains that bind us to sin and death and opens us up to that world, that right relationship with God that can only come through him and his word. It's not just a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of an alignment with God, a relationship with God. He intends the way for things to be and he carries it forward with power and authority. And when we think about that, we, we think about the things that go on in the world today. And we think about this truth that we can lay our foundation of our lives upon. And we think about all of the lies that are present in the world today. And there's so much, much more power in the truth. The clearest way to see it is just to consider the destruction and devastation that can come from a single lie. And I'd like you to consider today a lie that was written by Sergei Nilis in 1905. And he wrote down that the Jewish people were conspiring to take over and corrupt the world. And it was a complete lie. He had no basis of fact to judge that upon. But see, then his lie was picked up. And it was spread by the Nazi party. And it was taught to the children in schools and eventually led to the extermination of six million people. One single lie. And that's the power of one lie. Not everything that is written is the truth. And what I mean by that is if we simply look at social media today, or we look at the internet today, it's a dichotomy of both truth and lies and we have to judge it accordingly we have to be aware that not everything that is written out there is for our good now i was watching a documentary this last sunday night and a very prominent paleoarchaeologist had recently found fossil remains in tanzania that could completely invalidate the theory of evolution that has been taught in our schools as the truth for the past 150 years. Since Darwin wrote his theory of the origin of man, we have gone under the assumption, or they have given us the assumption, that this is the truth. But now they have DNA links that disproves the monkey chart that we were all shown in schools and we were taught that this is the truth but now we know that it's not my point here is is that the truth changes everything think about the power of this statement and it's a very easy one it's three words i was wrong how many times have we been wrong about something and failed to admit it but see, the power of that truth is, 
Have you ever been wrong about a person? Wrong in your approach to a given situation? And when you finally found out and understood the truth, not a single thing changed in your circumstances. Yet, with that one realization, everything changed at the same time. See, truth is beautiful. Truth is power. God has given us the truth you need for this life, and it's found in his written word in the Bible. We need to let go of the lies that guide our lives and turn the truth away from God's Word. There's things that you and I believe and hold on to that just aren't true. For example, one example was that Napoleon from the 1800s, well, he wasn't actually short as he's been purported to be. See, he was five foot six, and back in the 1800s, that was average for a Frenchman in the day. Here's another one, and I was watching the movie last night, and they were talking about zero gravity, but see, there's no such thing as zero gravity. There's no zero gravity in space. It's just that the distance between the objects reduces that force of gravity down so significantly that it seems like nothing compared to the roughly 14.5 pounds per square inch that we find here on Earth when we're standing here. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. Well, I have one for you here. Did you know that you can't fit your thumb inside your nostril? Hmm. Yeah, there we go. Actually, you can do that. And for those of you who tried, there's some hand sanitizer in the back of the sanctuary. See, there's all kinds of little lies that attack us every day. Without the truth of God's word to show us differently, we feed them. We believe them. And in some cases, we live by them. See, and that causes us to fall and fail because, because, they have no foundation. They have no truth to back them up. So if we don't get outside help, we'll never know the difference. There are little things that you've been taken to be true your whole life, and that God's word would say, well, no, that's not really the way it is. And here are a few that you might believe or have come to accept as the truth. Well, I will never really recover from this. I'm always one step away from it all falling apart. I can keep getting away with this and no one will get hurt. I'm not as good, I'm not as lovable, I'm not as pretty, capable, or godly as he or she is. You know, some people say, well, God is boring. He's just so old guy. God is too exacting. He's too uptight, too angry, too unfair, too uninvolved, too unloving, and too unkind. See, God, his word dispels every one of those little lies that sometimes we kind of accept as the truth. See, it's more of an escape to get away from the things that might be what I term an inconvenient truth. Inconvenient for our lives. It may change the direction of what we're doing, and it may take us out of our comfort zone. And yet, there are lies that people build their life on that foundation. When we hold on to the truth of God's word concerning those things, and put that truth into practice, everything changes. And I want to reiterate that again. When we hold on to the truth of God's word and we put it into practice, everything changes. See, and one of the problems and complaints that I've heard over the years is, 
well, that Bible is just an old book. It's just an old book. And if we were talking about, you know, building a computer from a manual, I'd be concerned. Because the manual from just 50 years ago would talk about vacuum tubes and data cards and old technology that really doesn't even exist today. We literally could not even use the information because time has made it irrelevant. But see, with the Bible, we're talking about guidance for what we believe, for how we live. What's always true is a guide that's been tested and proven over time. The reason I prefer an old Bible over something else is because I know that every generation has its own biases and ideas and culture has changed so fast over time. But God's written word has been proven true for every generation for the last 3,500 years. You can't find that in any other written word. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be in the Bible every single day. And I want you to imagine right now that you would just simply eat once on Sunday and then going for the rest of the week with nothing except for water. Well, you might survive, but you wouldn't be very healthy. And I don't think you'd be very happy. See, just 10 minutes a day in God's Word will make all the difference in all you do. It will even change the way you pray. God speaks to us through His Word. Prayer, of course, is us simply speaking back to God. And I find it amazing that through God's Word and our prayers, we get to have a two-way conversation. And that's steeped in truth and in life. In John 14, 13, Jesus told us, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Wow. That's a powerful, powerful promise. Now, before you go out and run out to the, to the store and start buying a bunch of lottery tickets, let me give you one more quick qualifier here. Jesus told us in that verse that he do whatever we ask in his name so that the Father can be glorified. So the Father can be glorified. The clearest and most complete way to know God is to be regularly in his word. To have that two-way conversation going through God, through prayer and centered on his word. God's Word and prayer works to, in concert with each other to change us, to change our behavior, to solidify our foundation, and to change the world around us through those truths. And many times I've said before that God gives us presents, and we keep them all wrapped up in the wrapper, and we never open up, and we never put them to use, we never put them into practice. They're useless. We have to take those gifts from God and put them into practice to help others change their lives as well. Jesus reminded us of this amazing combination when he prayed for us and for his disciples in John 17, 16 and 17. And he prayed this. He said, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth, and your word is truth. And so in this context in here, the Greek word that was translated as sanctify is hagesa. And it means to be holy and set apart for a special purpose. One thing you must remember and is that as a follower of Jesus, you are not of this world. You're different. The world has diverged from God's word and God's plan, and it's being built on a different foundation. It holds different values. It longs for different hopes. 
and it aspires to different gold. Remember, that foundation is ultimately a sinkhole that will swallow people up. And Jesus, in these passages here, he, he doesn't ask for us to be taken out of the world. He urges us to seek the truth in his word. To declare, ask for the truth in our prayers, and to build the truth as the foundation for our lives. One of the shifting and shaking foundations of the world is currently built on the weight and emphasis that it places on and puts it on our experiences and on our feelings. But our feelings, see, they shift on a daily basis and our experiences are very, very much limited by time. And one of the differences between God's word and our word, that is from our perspective, we have at best 70 to 90 years for our words to be proven true. But from his perspective, from God's perspective, he has generations, millennia, and really all of eternity to prove his he can make a promise to you and fulfill it through your great-great-grandchildren. And see, the beauty of that is, he still will be proven true. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The word is the primary way that God talks to us. We need to be the people of his word. Read the word, memorize the word, and study the word. Know the word. But above all, do what it says. Live the word. Put it into practice. Moreover, I want to give you a, a challenge to go out and share that love, that word of God with other people. Help them rebuild their foundation of their lives. See, your feelings, they come and go like shifting sand, but the wisdom of our culture shifts multiple times in every generation. But God's word endures. God's word stands firm. God's word will always be proven true. So get into his word. Pray through his word. And I want you to determine that you won't just simply hear his word, but you will put it into practice. And then when the waters rise, and the questions and the doubts come, when tragedy strikes and when life pushes back, you'll be able to stand firm on that foundation of God's word. So I want to close today with a challenge. I want to challenge you this week to be prayerfully in God's word each day of this week. So for some of you, that may mean you're going to have to set the alarm about 10 minutes early or take your Bible with you so that you can have it at lunch break. But if you could talk to God for 10 minutes every day, would you jump at the chance to do so? So I want you to try it for just one week. If you don't get anything out of it, well, at least you tried. But I believe that it will be the beginning of a daily conversation you will want to have for the rest of your life because it will bring God's truth to every area of your life. It will solidify that foundation of your life. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is truth. I pray that you would help every single one of us begin this two-way conversation that we can have through your word and prayer. Thank you that you want to instruct us to help us, to free us, Help us to pursue your truth and to persist in it. I pray that each person talks with you this week. Your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds to your truth for our lives. And we know this is Jesus' will for us. So it is in Jesus' name that we pray today. Amen. 
I want to thank you for joining us today at Grace Street Church. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come here and be with us. Check us out at www.gracestreet.church. Thank you and have a blessed week ahead. As we prepare to celebrate communion this morning, as Mark is preaching, I'm thinking, I'm hearing Jesus' words in my mind going, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Which then took me straight to John 16, verse 33, where Jesus tells his disciples, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He brings us peace. Right now, we really need that inner peace. That doesn't mean that this virus is going to go away soon. It means God is giving us the strength to get through it. He had this plan in place a long time. And he fulfilled his plan when Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived a blameless life, taught incredible truth, and then died on the cross for us. And it was on the night that he was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then later in the meal, he took the cup. He filled it. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for you, for your sins, and ultimately for all of our sins, past, present, and future. This is where we can get our hope and our peace. We have changed up the way we normally do communion. Normally it is done by intinction, where we take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. But out of an abundance of caution, we want to make sure that we are keeping people safe. And we have these cups, and there is a wafer in them. If you have one, go ahead and peel the top off and take the wafer out. Eat and drink the body and blood of Christ. Now, if you do not have one of these cups, if you would like to have some, because this virus doesn't appear to be going anywhere and we do not look like we're going to be enjoying one another's company in person anytime soon, please let us know. Message us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email us off of our website. We want you to be able to celebrate this with us. We will deliver them to you. So as we close out our service today, join us as we pray. Father God, you bring us peace. You bring us hope. And it's through that that we can look forward into the future, knowing that you are in control, that you are already there. And though many of us have started to have loved ones get sick and even pass away from this virus or any other number of things, Father. Help us, Father. So many of us are dealing with despair and depression and fear and anxiety and even anger. Being cooped up in our homes for days on end without any interaction with others. Father, as the church, let us rise up. Let us reach out to the people. Be it a text message, a phone call, FaceTime, Zoom, whatever it is. Father, help us to meet people where they're at. Show them the hope that we have and the peace that we get through you. It's through your Son, Jesus, that we have all of this. So, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, everyone join me. Amen. Amen.